Hello, everybody. This is John Farr and my uh, co-anchor here, Mr. John Ribner. Are you there, Ribby? Right here. All right. Good, 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 good. And today's webinar for the Webinar Wednesdays on SunBiz Weekly, we're talking about the, again, John, the dreaded su subject of Jason, which, John, I like your yep. definition of Jason better. Uh, it's, uh, what is it, just another, <laughs> what was it now? Just another salon owner's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, not like they don't have some already. And uh, so this is another right. one of their nightmares. But, you know, this is um, this is an important subject is that, you know, yes. we tend to, as an industry, we get all excited and ramped up for the January through June and particularly, yep. let's say, February through June. We got all excited yep. about the peak season and for good reason. Um and then it just seems like, as an industry, a lot of folks seem to go psychologically on vacation from July 1st yep. on. And, um, you know, they, they kind of let go of maybe some of their disciplines, things that they should be doing. And what Absolutely. they should be doing is, uh, very importantly, is trying to hold on to those not only good employees or good customers, rather, but also good employees. And the way, of course, you hold on to good customers is holding on to your good employees. So. Uh, Absolutely. A lot of you drop off during that July, November period, John. Absolutely. You know, and I, I understand that you wanted to discuss ways to uh, retain good employees through Jason. Um, what's the uh, what's the, the upside to that or the benefit? Why are we uh, wanting to hold on to these uh, good workers during these well, characteristically okay. slow months? Well, it, to a lot of people, of course, it, it probably seems obvious, but if you look at the cost of your payroll and what it costs to hold mm -hmm. on to good people, uh, whether it's, you know, let's say during the peak season um, versus the non-peak season, obviously we'd rather have the return on investment on payroll that we get January through June. We'd love to have that year round. But the truth of it is everything proportionately costs us more July through December, just because we don't yeah. have offsetting income. But the thing of it is, if you don't look forward to what you're going to have, who you're going to have to deal with your customers come the next peak season, or even into, say, deep into the holiday gift giving season, uh, it's going to yep. cost you. Because, boy, the last thing, and I think, and I would think, John, as an industry, I think we've finally gotten to the point where I think most people accept that trying to preach the health benefits of indoor tanning, we don't seem to be able to win on that point with the FDA and everybody else. But I think... The, yeah, or the FTC. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a no-win situation for us as an industry. I mean, I've always believed in the marketing the look good, feel good aspect rather than trying to play doctor. Yeah, and to, yes, yeah. right. And instead of playing doctor, to get that look good, feel good thing... What we've really got to fall back on is professionalism. That's what we really need. Yep. And so we can't have somebody at the counter. I mean, a lot of people do it, but, you know, to let good people walk away from you and then end up with somebody that maybe isn't qualified to be at the drive-up window for Wendy's uh, because they're a body <laughs> heart that's beating when they walk in the door in January. Right. Not good. So so what I guess what I'm saying is that you're going to invest more in the in the last six months of the year to keep good people on a proportionate basis than you do on the first six months because you only got about a third of the of the annual revenues in the last six months. And that's typically the way it is for all the analysis we do. It's usually the first six months gets you about 65% of the revenues in the last six months yeah. to 35%. So That sounds about right from yeah, what I've heard talking to salon owners, yeah. It, well, it, yeah, it just works out that way. I mean, it, there might be... Like where you might see a little difference in those numbers, which is a little off the subject here, but you might see it in a market that has a heavy college crowd, and that comes up uh -huh. in late August, August or early September. So their late August, September, October numbers uh, as part of Jason are really good for them or should be good for them, whereas for most salon owners that don't have a heavy college market, Jason, is it just what you said, John, another salon owner's nightmare? <laughs> no. So, but it doesn't have to be, especially if you've been reading uh, SunBiz Weekly and uh, listening to these webinars. Uh, throughout, throughout these last few months, we've really been, as a magazine, heavily focusing in on Jason and offering 
uh, tips uh, that salon owners can utilize to uh, not only weather the storm, but even be, be somewhat profitable, yeah. which definitely brings us to the topic of this webinar. And, you know, as, as, as you're talking, John, I'm thinking about what you're saying about retaining good employees during Jason months. Uh, I would imagine that come peak season, when you have a lobby filled with tanners, that's probably about the worst time to try to train in oh, a brand new employee, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, <laughs> when we have new clients come to us in January, I'm happy to have new clients, but I want to rip my hair out because, you know, the horse is so far out of the barn. I mean, really, you yep. know, you want to start doing your 2017 planning, really, in many ways, you want to start doing it now, such as you want to start yeah. on your, your ad promo calendar now for the rest of the year in 2017, and you want to make sure that you have a staff to sell that calendar. You, you want to keep them now because, you know, this the other thing, too, by the way, about Jason and having good employees is that uh, sometimes folks just say, well, I guess we're going to get during Jason what we get. We're, we're only going to get X amount of uh, revenue. But with good employees, what if you're instead of X amount, you got X plus 10 percent? Even though yep. it's a lower amount than during the peak season, it's more than what last year was. And if anything that we've all learned about this industry, it's a top line business. And even during the Jason months, you add an extra dollar of income, 85 or 90 cents of that is money that you can use for either uh, reinvesting in the business or in this yep. case, I'd like to suggest you reinvest it in your good employees to keep them. And along those lines, I understand you've kind of developed some strategies for key employee yes. retention during Jason. Yes, yes. Let's let's get into that. Uh, I Absolutely. thought you'd ask. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's let's move on here. And um, so I believe you said you had uh, six strategies. Is that yes. correct? Yes, I've got six of them here, and it's not. This is not necessarily a an exhaustive list. There's others, I'm sure uh, those folks that are watching this webinar now have some ideas too, but I'm going to kind of get to the heart of what I've seen that's worked. And sure. so here's six of the best ideas, I think, uh, six strategies for key employee retention. And first of all, and, I, and I'm going to just name the six, and then I'm going to go back and give you some details. One is to be a, a retail or be a, an employer that is intriguing. Now, why do I say that? And that's because... Most of our employees out there in salons are millennial aged employees. And yes. these are people, and John, you know, I hate to point out now, I know I'm too damn old, but John, you're kind of <laughs> in that category too. You're, you're kind of too old too. Um, in the, yeah. the millennials, you're not a millennial. And, uh, um, you know, it just comes down to that this millennial generation grew up with computers and computer labs when they were six, seven years old. And, Yep. It had to be kept exciting for them, or as I'm saying here, intriguing. So uh, yep. if, if you look over on the left there, the quote I've got on the left, it says, job and job sites aren't boring. Employers are boring. And that is That's true. And John, I think that's absolutely know. true. I'm Gen X and I've had some I over the years. I've definitely worked at some uh jobs that were boring and uh, they I didn't last long there I would find something else and move on and I would imagine that it's no different for the Millennials in fact they probably don't stick it out as long as I did you know as far and, as that goes and by the way your comment to stick it out really what happens and this really happens this is even more for the, the Millennials than anybody else is when we lose employees long before we lose them, meaning that mm -hmm. you know what I'm yep. saying, right? Uh, before yeah, absolutely, the they've already meant their body might be there, but they've mentally checked out of the job, and they're yep. really just going through the motions. You don't have an employee who's excited to be there and and wants to be a part of the team and wants to push the company forward. Yep. You just kind yeah, of have like a ghost in the machine type situation. This, this is a generation that needs to be kept stimulated. And if you're not yes. an intriguing employer to work for, they're looking for another job. Um, okay. Well, along those lines, John, as a, as a tanning salon owner, what are ways that they could make the job more intriguing? 
Well, what, what could a salon owner do? What I'm going to do, I'm going to show you these six points, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to hit them all with some detail. So I'll come sure. back to your question in just a minute here. So we, we sure. want an intriguing employer. Uh, do we possibly offer retention bonuses, which somewhat is an answer to your question you just asked, and I'll go over retention Absolutely. in a minute here. And uh, we want to increase wage levels with PSA, um, hello, with uh, per sale average. <laughs> Uh, bonuses, yep. and, I'll, and I'll go to that in a minute here. And then, um, oh, now let's go. Okay, so somehow the slide got mixed up here. But anyway, so to be intriguing. Now, to be intriguing as an employer, the what the millennials have told us is that feedback is a very critical element. Again, these are mm -hmm. people that in their second and third grade had computers and they were getting feedback from this machine that was sitting there in front of them and uh, they need to hear what their actions have developed they want they want that feedback now is it that they always yeah. like the feedback no but they do need feedback and actually John even as an X generation employee yourself um, mm -hmm. you know what it's like where you're you work at a job and you're there for a long time. You never get any feedback, positive or negative, and then right. somebody drops something on you someday that's negative, and you never saw it coming. Yeah, or as was usually the case in in jobs past, you always you always heard the negative feedback. You were always told, you know, what a what an albatross you were for the organization, but you were never told that you were doing anything good for the organization, and and you know you had to assume that you were, or else they would have showed you the door. But it would have really been nice to hear it. It would have really been nice to hear sincere and legitimate, "Hey, Ribby, you know you're doing a great job. You've helped us with A, B, and C." That's that that kind of stuff. I know makes an employee feel more uh, invested, I guess, in the company. So yeah, feedback. I, I can see where you're going with this. It's extremely important, especially to uh, the millennials who are also called Generation Y, as in W H Y. They seem to question everything, and that's not not a bad thing either. No, it it really isn't. And um, you know, it's they're they're going to question it. And you know, if you if you don't uh, you know jump into that, it looks like you're trying to hide something or whatever. And yeah, um, so yeah. Anyway, um, okay, so you want to be intriguing, and uh, we talked about feedback, um, and it is a critical element. So let me, let, me, let me pitch to everybody that if you want to do performance appraisals, this is absolutely the time of the year to be doing performance appraisals. And that's, by the way, what I normally recommend on per official performance appraisals is that you do them sometime in January, right before the peak of the peak season starts. And then you do them mm -hmm. again at the end of June or first part of July, um, because you know it's it's just the peak season's over with now. You can go back. You can look at numbers. You can look at their specific numbers, uh, the attributes that maybe you've watched, and you know that's the time to that's really the time to do it. So now another absolutely you'll have a, you'll have the time to do it in, in exactly. around now because yep. yeah. And, 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 and it's always good to touch base and, and just reconnect with those employees that have been there. I, I, I agree completely. I could see where, in fact, we should probably do some content on this for SunBiz Weekly, you know, a point-by-point -point things to go through your, your employees during this time of year. Might yeah, not be a bad it, idea. It would not be a bad idea at all. I mean, I think that people are, our listeners are, um, uh, subscribers to SunBiz Weekly are looking for guidance on this kind of thing, and uh, that's theoretically what who I'm supposed to be. So, yeah, I think it makes sense. So, feedback is important this time of the year to keep the job intriguing, to keep them reinforced. Uh, Absolutely. More, more training and retraining, and because now the you know the dust is starting to settle a little bit from peak, and this is yep. the time to look at your numbers and say, okay, what do we need training in now? And, and one of the things, and I think we may have talked about this on the last SunBiz webinar, but certainly one of the things that you want to really pay attention to is the EFTs that might be canceled or memberships canceled at this time of the year. And Absolutely. Training and retraining for your people on how to avoid those cancellations. Absolutely. Some, some new duty 
to to give to your employees to get them you know excited about the job and everybody likes doing new things and incorporating new duties i know i did i always used to get excited when my bosses would bring something to me hey john we think you'd be really good you know for this and well, I would be excited and enthusiastic about taking on these new challenges. And like you said, the EFT retention and bringing back those customers might be just the thing that that gets somebody excited and motivated. And a great a great task to give somebody uh, during this Jason time. Well, and, and John, there's actual research to what you just said. And uh, the famous classic uh, motivational theorist Frederick Herzberg, and I and I talk about him in my book, The Game Changer. He talks yes, about do. job enhancement as opposed to job loading and bringing yep. something that's new to the employee uh, that maybe they hadn't had a lot of training on before. And I'm going to talk about that, by the way, when we get in here uh, more is to talk about some of the things that you can do to um, you know, get employees more engaged, if you will, in the job. Absolutely. Uh, training and retraining is important. Now, uh, you know, contests. You might as well have monthly contests, and I'll talk about which numbers to have a contest on here in a minute. But now the other concept I want to talk about is lightning strikes. Now, lightning strike incentives, this is where, this is a, um, it's like a cash bonus that you pay out where your uh -huh. employees don't even see this coming. It's not necessarily a contest where you're weighing one against the other. So you see... Um, a particular effort that um, a customer, or excuse me, an employee is making that is above and beyond, let's call it like that, and they're kind of... Sure. So you're walking into the salon while they're running a shift, and you hand them 25 bucks and say, you know, this last weekend you filled in for some shifts that people couldn't make, mm -hmm. really, really put out, and I, I want to thank you for it, and here's a little extra something uh, to tell you, you know, how much I appreciate it. And it makes a big difference because in this last comment right here that you see, John, and there's hard research on this as well, too, in the human resource field that employees, and, and John, think about this one and give me your feedback uh -huh. on it, but employees sure. want to hear, even if they don't have some great achievement, you know, sometimes they just want to hear that you appreciate the effort they put into it. The outcome may not have been what we all wanted. Yep. You worked hard on it. And I think a lot of times Absolutely. We, get, we get frustrated because it's like you're saying, yeah, I wonder if my boss really knows how hard I worked on this. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, you know, what you just said, you know, the, the, the salon owner coming into the salon and, you know, handing $25 or even 30 or 40 whatever the, the amount may be, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, what would be more valuable to me as an employee? Sure, I would love the money. You know, it's money I didn't plan for. It's, 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 you know, it's a rain check or a windfall, if you will. But I think more importantly would be the validation and the, the you know, the knowledge that uh, my efforts were noticed and appreciated. That would really... It's, it's a great way to get, to get a lot of mileage out of it as a well, boss I, you, by, by recognizing... Your word appreciation is very apropos because I think a mm -hmm. lot of us, and that is, that's a real common thing according to the research is that a lot of us just don't feel like we're very well appreciated. And now, right. and, of course, and, and it's different because in my parents' generation, the greatest generation that lived through the Great Depression and whatever, they never had those expectations. They, I mean, it just wasn't there. They, they were just told, this is a job, you do it, and if you don't like it, hit the road jack. But yep. it changed yep. with my generation, changed even more with your generation, and it's even incredibly dramatically changed with the millennials. The millennials want positive feedback. Now, they want they want feedback yes. in general, even if it's negative. They'd rather have some feedback than no feedback at all. But they particularly yes. crave positive feedback. It's like, it's like being an 11-year-old from their generation that sits there and destroys a thousand zombies in a game. At least they're getting some feedback, you know. So, right, um, right. Oh, okay. That's absolutely true. So, okay. So let's let me talk about another subject here, and it is uh, retention bonuses. So yes, I was going to say it looks like we're sliding into point two on your on your yeah, list retention you bonuses. Absolutely, absolutely. We're sliding in there, and as I tell <laughs> you all the time, do the math. Um, okay. Well, what so, do you mean by that? 
Well, here's here's what I'm talking about. Let's say that you own, uh, you've got a single salon and you've got five employees uh -huh. and there's two of them that are really kind of your anchor in the salon. You really want to keep these two around. So you go to them privately sure. and you say, look, you've done a great job this year. Your numbers are good, whatever. Um, I want to make sure that I keep you and I want to keep you right into, oh, well, boss, you don't have to worry about that. I'm going to be here. But you see, the thing of it is, yeah, I, the number of times that I've heard where someone has said, well, I thought Lisa was going to stay with me, you know, through the <laughs> fall and into the, you know, and a lot of times it changes because maybe Lisa got a job someplace else that was a dollar an hour or more or whatever. And the uh -huh. last thing you want to do is lose uh, an employee, a good employee. And I'm going to give you some of the math on that in a minute. But so let's say that you said to this person privately, here are some of the things that you did right. I mean, and this, by the way, John, is a, and when we, we eventually you and I are going to do a webinar on uh, comprehensive compensation and incentive programs. That's one thing we should yes. our, our listeners we're going to do. Um, Absolutely. Very important subject. It, it is. We'll probably do it yeah. later in the fall as people are getting ready to set up uh, new staff and, you know, new strategies for the year. But um, Absolutely. But the thing that is, you know, you, when you look at those good people and you want to hold on to them, you have no guarantee today, July, whatever it is, you have no guarantee today that those people are going to be with you uh, come January. You hope they are. But what if you give them a retention bonus? You say, you know, you've done a great job. And here's mm -hmm. why. By the way, it's important to say why you think they've done a great job because the yes. same thing about doing uh, performance evaluations, if you don't tell them the why, uh, they're going to think you're full of baloney. So you got to tell them the why. But you say, okay, you've done a great job. Your numbers are good. You're filling for shifts. You're flexible. You're reliable. You're responsible. You've got good, mature judgment. But I want to hold on to you. So if you stay here until January, yep. uh, I'll guarantee you another $300 in your pocket. You don't have to do anything. Oh, wow. Just be whoever you are. What's that, John? That, well, no, I'm just I, – that's well. I've never had a boss say that to me, but no. I would like it. <laughs> I certainly would love to hear something like that. And Not only the compliments, but knowing that I'm going to get X amount of dollars in my pocket if I just, you know, stick around and keep doing what I'm doing. Well, let's say that this person you know? works for you 30 hours a week. They do a 30, it is a semi full time shift uh, with you, and they work 30 hours a week. Sure. And this person's doing a great job for you. 300 bucks, let's say over the next six months, uh, and all that is is $50 a month. And you're not giving it to them until right. you get to January, of course. But if it cost right. $300 and it was only, so in other words, if you divide it out, it was only $50 a month more you were paying them. It is well worth it. Because if they were working, say, 30 hours a week, let's say, let's round it off. We'll make it easy. 25 hours a week, that's 100 hours in a month. And you're paying sure. 50 bucks more. Um, you know, what is $50 divided by 100, um, what is it, um, 50 cents? Yeah, something like that. 50 cents. 50 cents an yeah. hour more. You're paying them to ensure that they stay around. It's well worth Well, now, let me play devil's advocate, John, because I can just hear, I can just hear some salon owners saying, well, now don't you set up a, or create an expectation that every six months or so this person deserves 300 or more i mean how do you address that because i know that's going to be a question asked I, well i, I just I, you, know. you know i'm not worried about the expectation for peak season because the 300 bucks that they made off the non-peak season by staying around is peanuts when it comes to the peak season i mean we've had True. in salons this year uh salon associates sales associates that have made several several thousands of dollars off of selling EFTs and lotion, and you don't have yep. to give any kind of retention bonus because they know where the money is. Now, I would right. love it. Right. I would love it if every good employee come July is waiting to hear about their retention bonus. I'd love it. That'd be great. Right, because it means it means they're plugged in and they're well, ready to go. Now, yeah. the one question you didn't ask, Mr. Ribby, and I would think that people listening to this would want to have this this question answered. They'd say. Well, if you do this for two of your five employees, what happens to the other three? Won't they be upset if they hear? And is there a good chance that they'll hear that these these two that you picked out have retention bonuses? Absolutely, they're going to hear. 
And a matter of fact, yep. in a way, you kind of want them to hear. And this is why. Wouldn't it be great if a, an employee that's a marginal employee comes to us and says, well, you've got to deal with Lisa. You're going to give her an extra $300 come January. How come you didn't offer that to me? You know well, what? what about me? <laughs> yeah, right. You know what? I'm glad that you brought up that question, uh, sales associate that's uh, not so good. Let me talk to you about <laughs> performance this last six months. Here's the problem we had. You weren't flexible as far as showing up for shifts. You called off a lot of your shifts. You were late to your uh -huh. shifts. Your sales numbers were down. I mean, you know, this is not a bad thing because maybe it gets them thinking about, you know, well, maybe I, I haven't put out, you know, to the extent that I should. And then you can say to them, I'll tell you what I'll do. Over the next 30 to 60 days, you show me that you can mirror what Lisa does with her attitudes and her performance, and then maybe I'll give mm -hmm. you a pension bonus to stay here until January. So it's not. You talk about this. You talk about this in your book. You call it an opportunity for redirection. I believe. Yes. I, yes, you're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And some people will say, "Oh my goodness, you're going to cause a lot of insurrection because someone's not getting that <laughs> bonus." But you know what? That's that's a good thing because maybe it gets them to finally realize that there's hardcore money here that's at stake if you don't get off your fanny and do your job. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. No employee wants to hear that they're leaving money on the table, but they also like to hear that there is money on the table to be gotten. Exactly. And you know what? There's also, John, yeah. there's, a, there's a peer pressure thing there, too. They look at Lisa, and it's almost like a little jealousy, and they say, well, you know, why is she getting this money? I, you know, gee, I guess I can show that I can do this as well. Now, if you have employees that don't care about a retention bonus or they don't care about that you said, well, if you can change your performance this uh -huh. way. I mean, if they don't care about those kind of things, then that just tells you something. You've got the wrong employees anyway. And that's something. Probably have some dead weight that needs to be cut. Yeah. And John, every year after peak season, there is dead weight that needs to be cut. Now, let me, let me go into the math of, you know, as far as the cost of turnover of good employees. Uh -huh. People are saying that are listening to this saying three hundred dollars, and again, it's only fifty bucks a month, gang. But look yep. at the cost of replacing a really good employee. The recruiting cost, maybe you're running an ad, you know, uh, yep. you, you might be. The interviewing time, and interviewing, by the way, people is not fifteen minutes standing at the counter and making sure this person's heart is beating. Interviewing is right. solid interviewing, and you, of course, you can get all kinds of interviewing tips and questions from my website, johnrfr.com. But also it's training. That's as well as Sunbiz Weekly. And it's also on Sunbiz Weekly. You're right. You're right. <laughs> so interviewing, the yep. training time. And, of course, just because you train somebody the first time doesn't mean anything. Most of the time people need training and retraining just because none of us learn, uh, you know, in five minutes everything that's got to be done. I mean, we need that constant reminder. Or errors by new workers. You can see new people coming in, um, and screwing up with a customer. It happens. And, yep. of course, customer service. And, you know, if you got new people and you're trying to replace your anchors, those people that you don't want to pay that 300 bucks to, uh, and <laughs> you get a customer service issue, that's a huge problem. But, John, that's not the biggest cost. The biggest cost on replacing good employees is something that most people listening to this call will not guess. And what's that? They won't. John, I'm telling you, they won't. They'll say, okay, I understand the cost of recruiting, interviewing, uh, training, retraining. I understand all of that. But they won't uh -huh. guess the biggest cost. And the biggest cost is management's time. Um, yes. I, I have a new client that I'm starting with, and they had a turnover this last year of more than 100% of oh my God. turned over. And the lady that I'm dealing with, who's the general manager of the chain, and she's a very, very sharp lady, but she's spending so much time, as she and her managers are, in screening and re-interviewing and retraining. It just So what happens is they spend all of this time on that, <clears throat> and they don't spend time on actually managing or developing the employees. And that's, you know, that's really... Who's selling memberships? Who's selling lotions? Absolutely. Who's... Who's selling upgrades exactly? Now, yeah. if you want, if you want a hard cost, because you could say, well, what's the real cost of interviewing, and recruiting? The National Retail Federation, which is the trade organization for 
Target, Walmart, Kmart, uh, Pizza Hut, whatever. They, any uh -huh. retailer belongs to the NRF. And what they'll tell you is that their estimate is to replace an entry level worker is about 6,300 bucks. Now, oh my God, you're talking about somebody in the drive up window at Wendy's. But see, I think it's even worse than that for tanning because we're selling an yeah. experience. Go ahead. I'm sorry, John. Yep. No, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, you are selling an experience, and I think that the costs would be higher. Uh, yeah, it, 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 yeah it, I'm, I'm agreeing with you entirely. Yeah, because just think of if you're that anchor employee and that you're working 100 hours a month, and uh -huh. um, now suddenly you know that goes away and you've lost, let's say that anchor employee was running a PSA of eight or nine bucks a transaction. Uh, they had uh -huh. a, a lotion average, whatever, and you put a green person in there, somebody that's totally, totally um, unproven over that. Oh, God. Goes, oh, that could cost you a lot more than $6,300. Bottom drops right out from under you on, it, on it that. Does, yeah. It does indeed. Okay. So we kind of you said You said the magic word PSA. Yeah. And I, I see that your third strategy involves increasing wage levels with PSA. I think now might be a good time to transition into the third the third point of your yep. program. I agree with you. It's it's up on the screen there for everybody to see. And so you're trying to retain these people and what you want to do, and, and this, by the way, this is natural. For people that have worked through the busy, se busy season, they've made some good money, and now they're thinking, oh, my gosh, look at all the tanners that are going away. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is increase their wage levels with PSA. Meaning that and what is PSA, John? What does that stand well, for? PSA again. Thanks, John. That's a good question. Per sale average. It means that okay. If I handle a hundred tans, a hundred uh -huh. coming in, and um, my total that I've rung up uh, in the system was five hundred dollars and a hundred. Uh -huh. PSA is five bucks. Gotcha. And we put out. Um, I put out some peak season numbers, which you can see on uh, my website. But, uh, you know, I would guess that the PSA average nationally for the peak season this year was somewhere around $6.50, $7, whatever. But you'll see a wide swing. You'll see uh, retailers with as low as $4.50 or $5, and some that will go up into well into the teens. The real productive salons have uh, sales associated with PSAs in the $14 or $15, and that's, that's huge because they're – selling a lot of lotions and they're selling a lot of yes um, but, i imagine you know upgrades and spa service sales and that, everything would help it will bring that up it does and of course what we try to do is increase incentives uh you get their wage levels up on psa because you're increasing incentives via psa works best now the best way to do it by the way um if you're going to have contests uh -huh. Typically what happens, every salon usually has one star. Uh, they have a particular person, yep. queen of tanning, and if you have a contest <laughs> strictly on dollars, that person's usually the one that wins every month. And what it does is the other employees just kind of give up because they say, oh, my gosh, Megan is always the best. She always wins all the contests. The way to do it is you do it from month to month. You show the percent improvement or the previous month and you rank those percentages by staff results, meaning that let's say that Megan, the star, let's say her PSA was was um, uh, $8 uh, for that. Okay. Was, was, you know, good good PSA. And everybody... Good wants, solid PSA. What's yep. that? Good solid PSA, $8. Yes, That's yes. Good. yes it is. Yep. And let's say everybody else is $2 below what she is. Now, okay. if Megan goes up 80 cents, she goes from 8 to $8 and 80 cents the next month, She's gone up 10%. But if the person that was at $6 went up like a dollar and a half to $7.50, they've gone up 25%. And so what you do is to keep the Megans of the world honest and keep her working to be the best and to help the other people come up there, you do it on percent improvement. Now, the neat thing about that is that person that was lower that raised their PSA by 25%. Now, the next uh -huh. one, they've painted themselves into the corner that they're, they're – previous PSA was 750 so now they got to do even better and so it, it kind of <laughs> the playing field so everybody has the perception you know what we can beat Megan and so gotcha. by doing these kinds of uh, incentives 
you then you divide their incentive payouts by their hours to arrive at the real hourly wage rate. This new client that I'm dealing with, they have many stores, and uh -huh. the general manager told me how this is working really well for her by dividing out what these people made by their hours worked. And, you know, suddenly somebody that thinks that they're working for minimum wage, and in this case it happened to be um, in that state, the minimum wage was, I think it's eight and a quarter. All of a sudden they're uh -huh. working at a, um, an hourly rate where they're making 1050 because you've taken their incentives and you've divided out over their hours. And sometimes we have to do that with employees. We have to show them this job is worth more yeah. than what you think it is. Yeah, um, because they don't they don't realize it unless they see it broken down in that manner. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and and yeah. you know that doesn't mean that they're they're idiots or whatever. They just don't think about it. They, you know, and millennials particularly, by the way, and I and I have to say this. I think that I I just would not hire people at minimum wage because I mean just and this is when John oh when yeah our webinar on compensation incentives. I'm going to really get on my soapbox on this because. The millennials will tell you. You have you have in your articles for Sunbiz Weekly as well. You've long been a, a proponent for uh, paying above minimum wage. Yeah, because there's a stigma with it. You know, I I probably interview. I know I interview more salon employees probably than anybody in this business because that's you know my whole thing. My big thing is part the, of what you do. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm talking to these kids, and of course. You know, I'm an old fart, so anybody below the age of 60 is a kid. But anyway, uh, I'm talking to these young people all the time. Every single week I'm interviewing them. I'm talking about, and then sometimes I'm trying to guide them for the client, maybe as far as their issues go, whatever. And, and they'll tell me there is a stigma. They don't want to tell one of their peer group that they're working for minimum wage. There's just a right. stigma there. But, but more importantly than that, John, you, you know, I've known you now for a number of years. You're an excellent communicator, and I think that whatever oh, you. you do, you'd be good at selling it because I just think that you have those great kind of skills. So, so let, oh, thanks. so let, well, let me throw this out to you here. Okay, so sure. the way I define John Ribner. He's got mature judgment. He's responsible. He's reliable. He's got good interpersonal skills. He's got a way of getting people to see his point of view. This is all what makes you a, what made you a great editor over the years uh, at IST and makes you a great editor of this publication. So now I ask you, Mr. Ribner, would you yes. work for minimum wage? Absolutely not. No, nor would I. And, and the thing about it is, when you hire people, you want to hire egos. And that sounds kind of strange to some people. Oh, I do I want an egotist? Ego. Yes, I'll take the gamble of having five people in my shop, in my salon, that have got an ego. I want them to say, damn uh -huh. it, I'm the best. But these are not the people that are going to come to work for you for minimum wage because if it's me, and no. I, I admit I have an ego, if, if, if I'm interviewing. Same here. <laughs> what's that? I have one too. <laughs> sure. sure. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would agree with that statement as well. <laughs> well, and, and egos are not all that bad. It's sometimes a reflection. True self-esteem that you feel, you know, I can do this, damn it. I'll show you how I can do it. But, you know, I want to hire somebody. Well, let me put it to you this way. Do I want to hire somebody whose self-esteem is low enough that would actually go to work for minimum wage? I don't think I want to do that. I want somebody well, who in I, essence says to themselves or says to me as a prospective employer, I'm damn good. You, you're going to have to pay me more than that. And, of course, maybe they You know, and I... I I couldn't agree with you more, John. And in, in, earlier, you used the analogy about the, the the fast food worker in the drive-through, and I want to circle back to that real quick. Go ahead. As a good example of something that I always say, um, my my two youngest sons uh, enjoy fast food, so I often find myself, you know, going through the drive-through to pick them up some French fries or a sundae or whatever, and you know. Oftentimes, I have to repeat my order three times. I still don't get it right. I have to go back in and, and get them to correct it. Uh, there's just myriad mistakes being made along the way. And I always say to my wife, minimum wage, minimum effort. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, just yeah. Th think about it. Think about it when you're talking about minimum wage. Okay, so we're back here in part two. Uh, we we ran out of recording time, John. I think people might observe that you and I are too gabby. 
a little bit. Yes, but anyway, <laughs> on PSA, we want to, uh, you know, calculate or end this thing on PSA calculations. It's, you know, if if you've done, you know, during the peak season, people maybe don't feel they need to do a lot of contests or whatever, just because there's so much mm -hmm. business flowing in the door. But during the non-peak season, to keep these good employees engaged, having those PSA contests, and I said PSA, absolutely. But I'm going to also show you some other stuff here on other uh, revenue streams. But again, the concept is the same. Whatever they make off of incentives, you divide those by the hours they work and show them what the real hourly wage rate is because that's what happens a lot of times is that uh, employees don't realize that this job is worth more than just their, their base wage rate. So, um, Absolutely, and of course then, then brings in the concept of their hourly rate, wage rate can be pretty much what they want it to be if they put forth more of an effort in the sales end of things. They can make yeah. almost as much per hour as they'd like. Yeah, I mean, really, that's a good point you just made. I mean, they really are in control of how much they make on a per hour basis. They just have to do what they're supposed to be doing, and that is, you know, sell. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and I know we were talking before on and, part, part one of this, we were talking about about um, uh, minimum wage, and I was saying, and I'll you know, I'll lecture on it again, is that I just don't want to hire people that are happy with being paid minimum wage. So I mean, if if, right. uh, if that's what you're offering, then you're going to get a person that has got a self-esteem that believes that the only thing they can get is a minimum wage job. That's not good. So that's my not good at all. Day. Not good no, at no. all. All right, now, so, when we talked about selling a moment ago, I think that's a perfect transition into point four in your plan yep. here is reward with good selling shifts. Tell us about that, John. Yeah, I mean, it really, you know, and, and it's something I didn't come up with. Somebody came up with it years ago and was telling me about it, and I think, you know, it only makes good sense. Why give shifts to people that don't produce? You reward your good salespeople by giving them the good shifts. So... If you need somebody mm -hmm. that's a, a filler, somebody to just fill in uh, and, you know, to cover a shift, then, you know, let's say it's on a Sunday. You don't normally get a lot of business on a Sunday. Fine. If you want somebody that's just kind of to watch the shop or whatever, that's one thing. But I certainly <laughs> wouldn't give those great shifts like four in the afternoon to close because usually four to seven is the best three-hour period of the day for selling tanning. Okay. And, you know, that's your – your drive home um, time, and yep. that's, I, man, you you got to reward your best salespeople, the ones with the best abilities with the best shifts. And what it does is it pushes the other people to want to get those shifts, assuming they want to sell, assuming they want to make some money. And if, right. they don't, if they don't care about the money they're making, then that tells you something about their value to you. So, so you look at the shifts, the best shifts should go to the best salespeople. Um, Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. And it also makes sense from a business standpoint. I mean, I would want my rock star behind the counter yep. when the majority of my customers are in my lobby. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. It only makes sense to, to, to be able to make the most revenue out of that that sort of peak time in the day. Yes. It, it absolutely yeah. makes sense. And, and the other thing that makes sense, as I mentioned before, about building – their wage rate with a PSA, and that's not the only place you can build their wage rate with, of course, is having monthly bonuses, not just contests, you know, where I talked about best uh, percent increase uh, uh -huh. PSA, but I would do it on the other revenue streams, EFT, and some people will say, EFT during non-peak, hey, you can still sell memberships. You know what? what Absolutely. We, what we do sometimes is we say, well, this is off-peak. I can't sell a membership. Well, if that's the attitude that you take, chances are you won't sell any memberships. But, you know, anything you can yep. do in Jason that is better than Jason of last year is all found money. And I say... Found money and, and an improvement over last. Absolutely. Yep. In fact, al along the lines of what you're talking about, John, we've already... Uh, many of our contributing writers have already shared strategies and ideas to sell memberships during Jason, uh, whether it's bringing existing customer or offering incentives to existing customers, bringing back people who've left, or attracting new. 
we <coughs> excuse me we've already run some stories on this and I'm sure we're going to run a lot more uh, it, it, it can be done and there and it, why I know this is there are salon owners out there who are doing it already so yeah and, yes. and, and it's fortunate you 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 mentioned it before and I suppose it sounds kind of self-serving for us at uh, Sunbiz weekly to say this but uh, well, it, it's actually it's a credit to you John you've You've gotten some very good um, columnists and some very good retailers oh, yeah. to participate, and they're the ones that are already doing this. They're proving that this is this is what you can happen. This is what you can do. Right. If if you don't just give up, Jason, that's what I I really it really gets me crazy. Absolutely. Give it's it that throwing the throwing up of the proverbial white flag and giving up. A lot of unfortunately, a lot of people in our in our industry do this. It's like it's this belief that. There's just absolutely nothing to be done to to uh, to improve during this time of the year. It's not true. It's a myth. Uh, you can do things, and not only can you do things, but you know we're sharing them uh, with people who. I'm not just making this stuff up. Like you said, we have contributors who are tanning salon owners, and they're sharing these tips that they're doing in their salons, and they work. And yep. we certainly encourage our readers to, you know, I mean, well, we share these for a reason. So you read it and use it. Use it at your salon and, and, and bring in the revenue. Speaking of which, I think that's a perfect transition into point number five. You talk about giving monthly bonuses on various revenue streams like EFT, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, okay. Um, I, you know, there's what you pay out in well let's let's say that your non-peak time um, on PSA let's say that you average five dollars whatever and uh, you're a single salon you've got maybe ten beds and um, during your off-peak months maybe you do um, I'll just throw out a number maybe you do eight thousand transactions during those non-peak months and your sure. PSA is uh, five bucks. Again, okay. let's say that your PSA, you can get your PSA to six or six fifty, whatever. It's a dollar and a half times eight thousand transactions. It's twelve thousand uh -huh. dollars. It's found money. Or yes. you can get instead of selling during your non-peak time, where you only sell maybe fifty or seventy EFTs. Now, because you're doing monthly bonuses on it. Uh, or contest, whatever. Let's say that you double that, and I've seen, John, I've seen EFT sales double and triple just because you're making more awareness to the employee about it. You're giving yep. them a reward for it. You start to double just in this off peak. You said, "Well, I went from 75 uh, EFTs to 150. Gee, that's not a big deal. It wouldn't be a big deal during peak." But if you add another yeah. 75 EFTs or 100 EFTs during off-peak and these people stay with you, uh, and by the way, it's funny, people that sign up with an EFT during off-peak tend to stay more months because they stay into the next peak season, whereas sometimes right. people that join in the peak season, boy, once it starts getting hot and sweltery outside, oh, I guess I don't need to tan inside. I'll go out to a barbecue and get myself fried, which is just a crazy right. set of logic, you know. But um, Yeah, horrible logic. It is horrible <laughs> logic, you know. But the point of it is is that if they join and you get another, uh, even another 100 PS, EFTs more than what you had last year, and they stayed with you for eight months, and they're paying an average of $35 a month, $35 uh -huh. a month times eight, it's uh, $280. I mean, that's huge dollars. That's huge money. So Huge um, dollars during, yeah, d during this time, when, yeah. which, which is characteristically an, uh, slow. Slow time. And absolutely. And, yeah, and, well, uh, you know, I think you said this on a webinar in the past. I mean, the time to be... The time to be aggressive with sales and promotions is not really during peak when you have people coming in anyway. It's now. It is. When you don't. It is. <laughs> what we what we yeah. do is we, we usually tell people, be aggressive on going after market share in January and February of the peak season. And then after that, uh -huh. then hold on to your horses because they're flowing in the door and they're standing in line. But you're right. This yep. is the time of the year to be aggressive the whole time because... Again, anything you pick up 
it's all found money. Okay, I want to move John yeah, to uh, the next point, which is that you know you want to keep these people around, and you so you're giving them more contests, more bonuses. You're giving them uh, performance feedback, all the stuff that we're talking about. You're giving them good selling shifts. Now I want to talk about being engaging, and salon yes, work should the last be engaging. Point on your plan. Yep, yep. yep. Now you're going to ask me, John. What do you mean by engaging? Well. I would ask that. What do you mean by engaging? Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully I have an answer. <laughs> Let's go back to something that we talked about before where I mentioned the theorist Frederick Herzberg talked about having um, you know, job enhancement instead of job loading, you know, just job loading. Now, yep. job enhancement is getting your employees into something that they find, let's say, intriguing or engaging other than just Deep cleaning, yes, deep cleaning is important, but you get into Absolutely. Jason months, and how much deep cleaning do you have to do because you're not doing that many customers? So it's important right. to know that besides selling tanning, can they do something that's interesting and yet helpful to the salon? Now, I've been Absolutely. preaching this for three or four years, that we need to get our employees involved in not just selling, but other things that they may find interesting. If you get the employee that has kind of their a hobby on the job, a hobby that's good for the, the store, it can make a big difference. Yep. So let's talk about that. Salon work should be engaging. Sure. And what should we give them? So one of the things I love doing is to create what I call captain positions. So you have employees, and let's say that you have a salon and you've got five employees, and maybe one of them is uh -huh. a manager, and maybe one is an assistant manager or whatever. And then you've got three sure. sales associates. Um, when we talk about, when you and I, we do the webinar on compensation and incentives, we'll talk about job titles and positions. We'll do that later. Yeah. But if you get your employees involved in some of these additional duties that can be fun. I mean, God forbid, uh -huh. we certainly would like to have our employees actually feel like they're having some fun on the job. So here's some oh, of the no, things. Oh, no, it's <laughs> yeah, That's right. Okay. No, not the job. <laughs> the end of the really? world. How can that? Yeah, that can't be possible. So one thing I right. like is a scorekeeper. And so what we do is we delegate to one of the employees that she configures the monthly rankings. Again, we talked about lotion averages before. We talked about PSA, talk about EFT, that kind of thing. So this person figures out what the rankings are of all the employees. Now, it's an interesting thing getting a uh -huh. sales associate involved and looking at those numbers because if that sales associate is one of your best selling people and they look at their own numbers when they're putting together and if they're near the top of the pack they're going to want to stay there they're going to know the numbers before everybody else if they're not uh -huh. doing so well it kind of puts a subtle pressure they put it on themselves like oh my god i've got to report these numbers and i'm only third of five people here i can't let that happen right. next month so getting them involved in it, and then they see the process, and that makes a lot of a big difference. Then there's also what I call the lotion queen. Who is the best, and why is that person the best at selling lotions? So when yep. you have your, your monthly sales meeting uh, of your salon, this is the person that on the agenda should be talking about how she sells a lotion, upsells a lotion, gets a person to maybe uh, get rid of that lotion that they feel that they're not doing well with, and you know, buys a better lotion. So we have a lotion queen. And then we have yep. an EFT captain. And this person figures the EFT close rate and EFT cancel rate. And we've I've talked about this on prior uh, webinars that yes, you, you want, have. You yeah, you want to show how many transactions a person conducted in the last month and you divide yep. that into the EFTs and you compare that ratio among all people to see who's doing a better job of selling EFTs on a proportionate basis. But you do the same thing Absolutely. on the cancellations too. So, so and again, yep. you know, the more you get your employees involved in this stuff, the more engaged they are, and that's what you want. Because, you know, Absolutely. salons, John, I work with chains. What I see as a common problem is that these employees are not engaged, meaning they don't see the owner's point of view or the manager's point of view. Right. They're there to put in their time and then go home. And there's nothing that bugs me more than if I go on a secret shopper uh, tour visit in a market and I walk into a salon and there's somebody sitting 
on a on the bench or a, a stool behind the counter on their Facebook. Sometimes I walk yep. in there on their Facebook. They don't even look up at me. Uh, they'll, they'll look down right, at the computer. Right, their head is buried in the phone. Their head is but, buried but, in the phone. But, you know, and, and the, the, it, it begs the question, though, is, is, is it the employee or is it the, the company culture that's created this sort of, uh, you know, uh, I guess, deinvestment into the company? I mean, well, that's, e either way, the result is the same, right? You have, well, that's, that's you know, a, a, well, use a word that we used earlier, intriguing, John. That's a very intriguing question. And my answer yes. to you is I think it's more the company than it is the individual. I mean, yes, we do hire some people that seem to be uh, dead from the shoulders up. I understand that. But a yeah. lot of times it's because we haven't created an environment or a culture that encourages them to participate in the company more than just right. sitting there and watching Facebook. Right, and, and, and that's that's a very good point. I mean, uh, as, you know, I've never, you know, until recently, I've never owned my own business. I've always worked for somebody else. And, you know, certainly over the years and years of being, you know, the perpetual employee, if you will, you know, I've, I've worked for a variety of companies, some good, some better, some bad. And definitely the bad ones were always the ones that had the attitude of, you know, you should be lucky I'm giving you a job. Exactly. That type of thing. And the companies that I enjoyed were the ones that, you know, had more of a, you know, you're part of us, we're, we're part of each other, let's let's do this together kind of, you know, well, kind of atmosphere or it, attitude, if you will. It's the realization that really with the millennials out there today, you need to be the employer of choice. There need to be a lot of reasons yes. other than just compensation. People stay with you. And when we do this scorekeeper, we have a lotion queen or an EFT captain. And lastly, if we have a company spy, it gets people excited about where they work. I love to set up a company spy where your employee, they tan to keep some color for selling, but they don't tan with you with your salon. They tan with the competition. Right. And we actually give them the cash to go tan with the competition because then they can see how the competition is doing their pricing, maybe their marketing, Absolutely. see how the customer service is in store. You never know, by the way. They may come back and say, uh, this gal that uh, waited on me today, she's really good, and maybe we should interview her. You might be able to steal somebody from the competition. So, uh, Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing. Yeah, because the great thing you about can take, Yeah. Go you ahead. can attract their star players. Well, if you can attract the competition star players and encourage them to jump ship it, uh, you know, obviously the benefits there I don't need to get into. They're, they're pretty self-explanatory. But I will tell you this, John, if you want to take away their star, if you look at the top of the slide, number six, salon work should be engaging. And that's the yes. way that you're going to steal somebody is if – because, you know, you have yep. in, the, in the market in tanning, you have a market, uh, you have a brand as a salon uh, in the services you offer, but you have a brand as an employer, and you want your brand as an employer that this is a, 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 an exciting, fun, rewarding, and engaging place to work. And I think maybe that's where we should uh, we, we should stop today because I think we've we've talked long enough here. But uh, really, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. We we definitely have, and and I I will say this real quick. Listen to you talk about you know the sales superstar the EFT captain the salon spy you've definitely given me an idea for uh, some content to write for a future issue of Sun Biz Weekly I almost am tempted to call it uh, salon stratego if anybody remembers that old game stratego. yes I do I do remember that <laughs> there was a spy there was a, a colonel there was a captain there were there were all these different rankings <laughs> and yes <laughs> I, you know, I don't know if everybody's going to remember that. I probably won't call the the, the story that, but I mean, the, the the point remains is this is like an interesting way to you know everybody has a title, everybody has a value, and in identifying the the employees who would be good for each of those uh, each of those titles, you know, well, I think. What, that's another thing, yeah. about it, John, from from millennial research that millennial research tells us millennials do like titles they absolutely uh -huh. like titles they do yes i mean okay. so we what we what we set up with a client when we can is we set up a um, 
a, a structure that you know gives us, if not the reality, the perception of a career path. So we bring somebody in as a sales associate one, and they're that way for maybe 60 days if they do really well. We promote them to sales uh -huh. associate two, and they get maybe another 50 cents or 75 cents an hour or whatever. If they do uh -huh. real well and they show responsible behavior, maybe we promote them to an assistant store manager. So we have a real chain of command. When we get done with a client, they normally Absolutely. walk away where they've got an actual organization chart. Holy yes. crap. We're starting to look like a real business. <laughs> And that's what we want. Absolutely. These, these, are, these are some great things that I think you and I and everybody here at Team Sunbiz Weekly, whether we do it as written content or a webinar or both, you know, the, I, I definitely, this, uh, today's webinar has definitely lit the light bulb inside my brain as far as some more uh, useful information that we will provide for our readers. Absolutely. Well, I think I, I would hope we've achieved that, and I would hope that our readers will give us some feedback on it. We got a lot more webinars coming up on SunBiz, so John, thank you for all your participation and keeping me organized. Oh, no problem. And um, no problem. We'll be back at you guys again. We'll be announcing another uh, SunBiz webinar soon. We're going to talk about compensation later on in the year as we get closer to. Uh, into the fourth quarter, but we've got one coming up yep. that uh, to kind of help people be better at getting more out of a trade show. We've got Smart Tan coming up yes. in October, and so we're going to do one soon on how to get more out of the national trade show so your people aren't yes. just going there. Make the to, most of your trade make, show experience, absolutely. And, and your dollars because, you know, going to national, yeah. it's not cheap. So uh, No, it's, it's a business investment for sure, it is and you want that business. ROI. Yep. yep. Well, John, thank you, uh, and You're you welcome. have a good one, and we'll be talking again soon. Absolutely. See you later, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.